Hi, my name is Sean Boyd. I'm the Curator of Archives at History Colorado, and this presentation is about Florence Martin, um, who I encountered for the first time when I worked at the Douglas County Libraries in the History Department, and uh, kept running across these references to Miss Martin. Um, they were having school at Miss Martin's house and um, there was a robbery at Miss Martin's house. So I wondered who Miss Martin was that she had the school at her house. Uh, and I could tell that it was somewhere near Daniels Park, but I didn't know exactly where. So this presentation is the result of my research around that. So Florence was born on Christmas Day, 1867, in Clarence, Sydney, Australia. So she is from Australia. Her parents were Sir James Martin. There's a picture of him. He was the premier of New South Wales, like the governor, and he was later chief justice of the Australian Supreme Court. Her mother was Isabella Long, who was the daughter of William Long. And Isabella's father had been transported to Australia, so he had been arrested in England and sent to Australia, and he had become a successful, um, they said hotelier, other sources say bootlegger, um, in, a, in a colony where people were often criminals at the time, in the early 1800s, uh, he was very successful. And Isabella had money and Sir James had political um, aspirations and the two of them together were a, a power couple of the mid 19th century in Australia. And um, they ended up having eight boys and seven girls. So um, Florence had eight brothers and six sisters. There were a lot of kids in this house. Um, the upper right-hand corner shows a picture of their house, that's the estate. The lower right-hand corner is the view of Sydney Harbor from their house. So this is a very, if you watch Downton Abbey, this is a very Downton Abbey type existence. This is a picture of their house, um, the gardens. I don't know if one of these girls is Florence. I'm not 100% sure if the two adults over on the right-hand left-hand side are the parents. Uh, it's a picture I found at the National Library of Australia f of, the, of the house. But her father died, Sir, Sir James died in 1886, but through Lady Martin's standing and her large fortune, her children moved in the highest social circles. Not content with a life of idleness prescribed for young ladies of her class, Florence enrolled in the University of Sydney in 1891. After completing the first year with honors in physics, she re-enrolled in 1892. But during that year, she began working instead as an unpaid research assistant for the university's physics department under a family friend, Professor Richard Threlfall. And this is Professor Threlfall on the left, on the right, and Florence on the left. This was not a whim. After two years Martin spent in Threlfall's laboratory, she proved a reliable and accurate observer, and he said her most constant assistance was valued very highly. This is a picture of the University of Sydney. When her mother and most of her sisters left for Europe in early 1893, she remained behind to complete the chief piece of her research on which she had been engaged, and it, which was an attempt to verify experimentally some of the conclusion of conclusions of Maxwell's electromagnetic theory concerning forces acting in magnetic circuits. So that's what this uh, postcard was about. Um, the report was written jointly with um, Dr. Threlfall, and it was read to the Royal Society of New South Wales in July of 1893 and was published in London in the Philosophical Magazine. Um, she then sailed for Europe, preceded by a letter of recommendation from Threlfall to Sir Richard Thompson, uh, director of Cambridge's renowned Cavendish Laboratory. So this is where she, she worked when she was in England. Um, she appears to have only been the second Australian research student to work with Cavendish, um, then be rapidly becoming the mecca for every aspiring experimental physicist. Few Australian women had ever done so. She spent about 18 months there, attending the advanced undergraduate practical classes, as well as pursuing her own 
fairly inconsequential research on the expansion of gas between the plates of a capacitor when the capacitor was discharged. She returned to Sydney in 1896 and immediately resumed her collaboration with Ralfall, publishing two more joint papers. Two years later, however, she returned to England. Oh, he returned to England. Sorry, he returned to England and her career in physics was entirely over. For six months during 1899, she acted as the university's tutor to women students, and then she became their housekeeper. Oh, then she, she went to work for her mother, who was now senile. So Florence's career outside of her home is over uh, by 1899. Between eight, so between 1892 and 1899, she was, she was working in physics, but now she's sort of stuck in this big house with her mom and she's the unmarried sister. Um, so you can imagine she's, she's a pretty smart lady and she's just waiting for something interesting to come along. And that something interesting that came along was William Cook Daniels. We're gonna, we're gonna make a divergence here for a few minutes and talk about him. He was born in 1867, same year as Florence, and he was the heir to the Daniels and Fisher department store on 16th Street in Denver. His father, William Bradley Daniels, had founded the store in Leadville during the Colorado Gold Rush in 1859-1860. And he had moved the store, the father, William Bradley Daniels, had moved the store to Denver in 1864 and turned it into one of the most successful dry goods and then department stores in Denver. Um, Mrs. Daniels, so William Cook Daniels, who I'll call Cook, for the rest of the presentation. Mrs. Daniels died in 1881 when Cook was about 10 years old. So here is this single wealthy dad and a 10 year old son living in Denver, no mom. Um, and then his father died in 1890. So his growing up years were by many accounts, very um, pampered and um, masculine like he was he was sort of of the generation that really appreciated Theodore Roosevelt and the Rough Riders and he he um, was a bit of an adventurer as you'll see so Cook inherited the store when he was 21 and he was at Yale although he was actually in Yokohama at the time so this is the Grand Hotel in Yokohama where he would have been staying when he got the notification that his dad had died um, he didn't officially become part of the company until 1897 when he turned 30. Um, so there's this gap between 1890 and 1897 where he's a little more footloose and fancy free. He, he went back to Yale to finish up his, his undergraduate degree. And while he was there, he married a woman named Edith Turner in, in 1893. Uh, I don't have any pictures of Edith. <laughs> um, but then he visited Wellington, New Zealand in 1896, and that's getting him close to Australia, but he's, but he's not quite there yet. Um, in 1898, he became the Adjutant General for the Second Division of the Fifth Army during the Spanish-American War. He was part of a group of about 25 officers from Colorado who went to the Philippines for the Spanish-American War, and he met his lifelong friend Charles McAllister Wilcox while serving there. Um, I'm not sure if one of these is, is Cook in this upper right-hand picture. I th it could be the third guy over, based or fourth guy over, the one, the one sort of toward the front next to the guy holding the cup, um, just based on it looking like the picture on the left. So then in 1898, after the war was over, uh, Cook came back to Denver and started working in the store working on the store in earnest. This is a picture of the Daniels and Fisher store during the parade after the 18, uh, after the Spanish American war. So this is like the, the celebration of returning and that's from the history Colorado collection. Um, and the, the guy in the upper right hand corner is his friend, Charles McAllister Wilcox, who he put in charge of the store and of instituting his vision of, of modernizing the department store. You can, you can imagine this, this young man, he's 30 years old and he's inherited this, this business and he wants to make it a very modern thing. Um, in 1899, a radical socialist newspaper called the Arena described him as one of the best socialists we know in this town, meaning Denver. 
This young man returns to Denver and takes charge of millions he inherits, remodels his great store, makes it the finest in the West, and begins at once to introduce his kind of socialism. That's the end of the quote. His radical ideas included holding school for the employees before opening hours, closing early on Saturday, and providing health insurance and a credit union. So not exactly overthrowing the capitalist system, but he's providing some benefits to his employees and it became a, a good place to work. Uh, here's another account of Cook. Uh, in about 1900, uh, an African-American poet from Denver named Paul Lawrence Dunbar wrote to his friend in Ohio, and here's the quote. I must tell you more about this friend of mine sometime. He's just two years my senior, but was major in Lawton's division and commended for bravery and efficiency. He's a fine fellow, but I am going to terminate my friendship with him. You will wonder why. Well, he is immensely wealthy for his age, um, possessing something like two millions of dollars, and all the favors come from his side. I spend an afternoon each week with him. He has the finest private library in Denver, and he presses upon me the loan of expensive books. He wants uh, to take me duck shooting and provide everything. We smoke together and read and chat for hours, but the books and cigars are always his. When I was, going, when I was doing my new story, he actually took time from his business, the management of the finest department store here, to help me on a stampede scene. He is an enthusiast, and I like him, but somehow I feel a bit cheaper by his kindness, though I know I should not, for he is very genuine. This is a picture of the inside of the department store, and in 1900, he published a book on the department store con uh, system. It's called the department store system. You can find it on Google Books. Um, so that, that... In 1902... He happened to be in Martinique during a volcanic eruption and took a photo that sold for 3,700 pounds in London. This is not that photo. This is a different part. But he, he took a photo that, that sold in 2009 for 3,700 pounds because it was the only photo of this volcanic eruption in Martinique. Um, then he went on a Royal Geographic Society expedition to Papua New Guinea. That's what this picture on the right-hand side is of. Um, this was in 1903. And they went to Papua New Guinea and they, he identified this bird, which was called the purple-breasted contiga, and gave the specimen to Cambridge University in England. And, um, it was in Oxford, sorry, the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford. And he also has artifacts that were collected on the exhibition. This is a board from the Gabari people of Papua New Guinea that is still in the Pitt Rivers Museum collection um, that he helped collect. And while he was off, as they would say, in the bush in um, Papua New Guinea, he was gone for like a year with no contact with the outside world. And his wife, Edith, divorced him while he was gone, claiming that he had disappeared. And by the time he got back, she had married someone else and was living in Colorado Springs. And of course, the media had, you know, asked him about it as soon as he got back. And his response was, I'm not a bit surprised. So here we are. We have Florence. That's Florence. It's now 1905. He's come back from, from Papua New Guinea. And you have wealthy Florence stuck at home with her mother. And here comes William, who has a new fiance named Cecily Banner. Oh, she, here's Florence at her house. Then we have William, and he's got his new fiance, fiance, Cecily Banner, who is from England. But he's about to go back to New Guinea, and he doesn't want her as far away as Edith, having, having lost Edith when he went into into Papua New Guinea. So he needs a place to leave Cecily that's closer to Papua New Guinea. So somehow they meet Florence. Um, Cecily's great grandfather had been a baron in England, but her father had died in 1903. So she's pretty much on her own. Um, her uncle was a bishop in the Episcopal Church in Australia, though. So she was supposed to be visiting him as well. So then in 1907, um, Daniel's returns. So for two years, Cecily and Florence were living together in that big house 
with Florence's mom, who was going senile during this time. So, that, you know, they were, they were having a lovely time. Um, and then in 1907, Cook comes back and he marries Cecily uh, in England and Florence goes to live with them in England and France. And then they travel around the world. Uh, in 1909, Cecily and Florence and William uh, slash Cook uh, visit Denver for the first time, 1909. They've been traveling since 1907. He doesn't come back to Denver until 1909, even though he owns this department store. They're supposedly running all over the world buying stuff for the department store. That was the excuse for all of their world travel. Cecily was described in the Denver newspapers as, quote, vivacious, extremely fair to look upon, and possessing an unusual charm. She also shocked the Denver reporters by pulling out a cigarette during her interview, but they assured their readers that this was very usual in Europe. So Florence is also mentioned in this 1909 newspaper interview, and this is the first time Florence... Um, has been to Denver. It's the first time the Denver Society is introduced to her. And she talks about having eight pet snakes, though she said she hadn't brought them with her. And, and she talked about them. Um, she keeps them in a box and they play around each other like puppies. Uh, and when I talked to someone who actually knew Miss Martin, I said, she's totally messing with them, isn't she? Like, she's just messing with the local yokel people that the, the newspaper in Denver out on the middle of nowhere. Um, I, I thought it was a very telling and very funny article. What they saw, whoops, sorry. What they saw would have been the Campanile under reconstruction. So this tall tower on the, on the right-hand side had actually collapsed in 1902 and the Venetian council had decided to rebuild it and it, was, it wasn't finished until 1912, but they were definitely there before 1911 because William decided to rebuild it, rebuild it himself on the corner of the department store in 1910. It's now the Daniels and Fisher Tower in downtown Denver. So these are some pictures of the tower um, there in town, and that is what's left of the department store. That entire block was um, the Daniels and Fisher department store. Uh, the tower uh, was saved by uh, the first state um, historic preservation officer, Stephen Hart, who the research uh, center at History Colorado is named after. Um, and you can still get in there. Um, they do, they have done tours in the past and the clock is maintained on the top. Okay, so here they are, footloose and fancy free, running around. Europe. And then in 1918, tragedy strikes. So William died unexpectedly in Buenos Aires. He um, had contracted a lung disease when he was in the Spanish-American War, and apparently that had um, flared up. And this was also, 1918 is the year of the Spanish flu, so there were um, other lung ailments floating around, like the flu could cause, it could exacerbate other problems. So when he died, he left, so he died in March, and he left his will to Cecily. Of course, he left half his estate to Cecily. And he actually left a quarter to Florence, uh, who was described in the newspaper as daughter of the late Sir James Martin, Chief Justice of New South Wales, who has lived with his family and been his wife's friend for many years being now with Mrs. Daniels in Switzerland. She receives one-fourth, and Charles McAllister Wilcox, the manager of Daniels and Fisher, who also receives one-fourth. So, okay, so William dies. He leaves his money to, to Cecily, but they can't find Cecily. All efforts of the administrators of the Major William Cook Daniels estate to communicate with the two of the chief beneficiaries have been unavailing since the document was presented for probate in the county court in Denver. The widow, Mrs. Cecily Danner, uh, Banner Cook Daniels, when last heard from, was residing at the Grand Hotel Baronhof, Bern, Switzerland. By the terms of the will, she inherits one half of the estate, and Miss Florence Martin, who inherited one quarter of it, is supposed to be with her, aiding in the conduct of an army hospital. 
You also have to remember that World War I is going on at this time, and these people live in Europe. So they're living in Switzerland, working for the World or the Red Cross. And that was really what, what curtailed all their world travels. They really stopped traveling around in about 1914 and started um, working for the war effort. So then, unexpectedly, Cecily died in October of 1918 of pneumonia, but it was related to the Spanish flu. That was a side effect of, of the, the flu. So now Cecily has died and she has left her money to Florence. Cecily Banner Daniels, widow of William Cook Daniels, died at Guerton on Lac de Thun, Switzerland. Other than the de that the death was due to pneumonia, no details were given in the telegram received by Charles McAllister Wilcox in Denver. So Cecily leaves all her estate to Florence. So Florence has now inherited um, three quarters of Cook's estate and store. But who's been running the store this whole time? Charles McAllister Wilcox. Um, he's been there managing the store, taking all the telegrams, doing all the day-to-day -day work. There was also an aunt who showed up and claimed some of the estate, but that was eventually denied in court. Um, so where they ended up, Florence did get at least some interest in the store. And uh, she did to um, take the idea of helping the girls that worked in the store. And she purchased a large property that is now Daniel's Park to be a retreat center. And she built a house there and a barn. The barn is still there. Um, and she lived there part-time from 1920 to 1936. Um, one of the interesting things that happened during that period between 1920 and 1936. She also had a house in Denver. She also had a house in London. So she was she was sort of splitting her time between all these houses. And the, the Carbonate Weekly Chronicle from Leadville, which often the local Colorado newspapers would reprint each other's articles. So this may have started in Denver. It may have started in the Douglas County newspapers, but um, she was at home in Daniels Park in this house on the upper right-hand corner. Um, that photo's from Denver Public Library. And um, what apparently happened was, you remember that she has all these brothers and sisters back in Australia. Well, that then meant that she had a lot of nieces and nephews. And one of her nephews came to Denver to visit, and he was a less than reputable gentleman. And he started talking about his wealthy aunt that lives in the middle of nowhere to some people who were also less than reputable, and they decided to rob her. So they came and um, they were trying to get $250,000 in jewelry and, and jewels, I guess. Uh, they forced their way into her house, which she was calling Valmina. Um, three miles east of Sedalia, but the screaming of six French servants in the palatial home thwarted the bandits. And she stood there talking to them while the chauffeur drove down to Sedalia to alert the sheriff's office. And they actually saw the, apparently according to other accounts, they saw the chauffeur leave and they fled as soon as they realized that other people had been alerted. But you can imagine her standing there saying, I don't have the money here. You know, it's it's all in the banks or whatever. And and not to mention a lot of her wealth was probably tied up in the in the land as well as in the department store um, in investments. I mean, she definitely was a very wealthy person. I have since found evidence of her um, also meeting with the, after Charles McAllister Wilcox was no longer the president of, of, the, um, of the department store, she then met with A.B. Trott, who was the, the president. They were, they were friends and he would have dinner with her when he was in London. He was also going all over the world buying stuff for the store. So that was not unusual. Okay, so then the house burned down. Um, now, I should say before the house burned down, this is where they had the one-room school for the neighborhood um, around um, 
around what is now Daniels Park. All the kids who would have lived on the either the servants, the kids of the servants that worked in this area, the kids um, whose parents lived in what is now the Daniels Park area, or I mean the, the Daniels Park Road area. So maybe the there wasn't, Cherokee Ranch wasn't really there yet, but um, the kids that lived in that area around Cherokee Ranch also came to school here. Um, we have the diary um, at the, they have it at the library in, in Castle Rock. They have the, um, the account of the person who was teaching school there in the 1920s. And uh, she was like driving the kids home in her Model T. So this was this was such a remote location. They had the equivalent of a school bus in 1920, um, so that the kids could get here. But because most of the kids were related to Florence Martin's ranch and the servants that worked for her, they had school in the basement in this house. Um, the house then burned down in 1936. She made her first donation to, of property to the city and county of Denver in 1920 and named it Daniels Park after her friends. So I think she realized um, early on that she wanted this to be a retreat center. She wanted it to be open to people. So she started making the donations within two years of purchasing the property. Um, and she named it after William Cook Daniels and Cecily Banner Daniels, who were her friends. That's why it's called Daniels Park. Um, okay. So then throughout the 1930s, she's still living part-time at Daniels Park. She's also living um, in, uh, in Denver. Uh, she helped organize the Denver Civic Theater with, with Helen Bonfies. So the lady in the upper right-hand corner is Helen Bonfies. She's considered the, the mother of theater in Denver. And the Denver Civic Theater was renamed the Bonfies Theater. It is now the tattered cover on Colfax. Um, the goal was to provide good theater, amateur actors, and professional direction. And Florence, Helen Bonfies, and Mrs. Werner Z. Reed provided um, all the financial backing for the theater through the depression. Uh, then in the middle bottom is the Mary Reed Hall Theater, which started in 1929. So she also helped start that theater, which is at DU. Uh, and then in the lower left-hand corner is um, Miss Martin when she was much older with um, Campton Bell, who was the, a theater professor at DU. So she was connected in with this theater community. The picture in the upper left-hand corner is Florence, uh, and the center picture is also Miss Martin at various social events in Denver. So she, she was participating in the Denver theater community and other voluntary things. So then she gave the other part of the land to the city and county in 1937, which completed the donation. Um, so all of it was, was given to the city and county of Denver by um, 1937. And these articles just kind of show, it seems an anomaly to say that the new mountain park has been added to Denver's mountain park system on the plains 20 miles from the foothills. Such became the case, however, when Charles McAllister Wilcox and Miss Florence Martin, lifelong friends of the late Major William Cook Daniels, presented Daniels Park to the city and county of Denver. This is in 1920. The land purchased is better known to Denver residents as Auto View. Um, it was really Florence who gave it because it, it it says in these other articles that that it was her. And they do mention, so in the article on the lower right-hand side, the second column there, uh, mentions the place where Kit Carson, the famous scout, built his last campfire before he died on his way south in a wagon train. So here's the original photo that was reproduced in the newspaper. Um, I found it once I started working at History Colorado. Now, just to talk about Daniels Park a little bit, in case you don't uh, know, it is a large parcel of land in, um, which abuts the Highlands Ranch backcountry. Um, it also is near the Sanctuary Golf Course and the Cherokee Ranch. Um, one feature of interest in Daniels Park is that Kit Carson marker. But I just want to talk about the map here for a minute. So all these green parts on this map are open space. 
And then to the um, west of here, I didn't, I didn't grab that part of the map, but there is a wildlife corridor that goes all the way from the back country to the mountains. And even this yellow part is pretty un, um, uninhabited. So Daniels Park is part of a huge piece of land that um, will remain open space, including the Cherokee Ranch, um, the IREA property, the Duncan Ranch and the Highlands Ranch backcountry, of course. So this is a huge wildlife area. Here's some pictures of the buffalo at Daniels Park. Of course, we all love Daniels Park. And then this is the Sanctuary Golf Course, and I think this is just Highland or uh, the Daniels Park. It might show a little bit of the Highlands Ranch backcountry, but I, on the on the far right, there's the little picnic pavilion up there. So this is after um, the fire that they had in the early 2000s. And then this is the Kit Carson marker. So <laughs> this marker is a little controversial. Uh, it, it was put up by the Territorial Daughters of Colorado in 1923. And it's on the entrance to the Sanctuary Golf Course. And it says that it's where Kit Carson uh, accompanied by Major D.C. Oaks, built his last campfire in 1868. Um, I, I'm a little dubious about this because Kit Carson died in Taos, New Mexico, and he got sick in Washington, D.C. Now, yes, did they, they took him on a train from D.C. to Denver. Actually, they couldn't have taken him on a train all the way to Denver in 1868 because the train only went to Cheyenne. So then they took him down on wagons from Cheyenne to Denver and then down to Taos. And yes, they would have gone down what is now Daniels Park Road because that was the territorial highway. Whether he was lucid through any of that, I mean, I guess it's possible that he could have gotten out of the wagon and this was the last time he did that and uh, lit a campfire. So either way, it's an interesting note of Colorado history. Um, and something you can look for when you're in the Daniels Park area. So Florence spent the rest of her life doing charity work after she sold the, the Dan, or gave Daniels Park to the city. Um, she worked for World War II relief, which is up with that picture in the upper right hand corner. And then she sewed stuff for World War II as well. So she's holding the sign in the in the one on the right and she's sewing she's the lady on the on the right center um sewing baby things uh during world war ii uh she passed away in 1957 and her estate went mostly to her niece but she did also endow a lecture series which is called the cook daniels lecture at the art museum it was still active as of 2008 and you'll notice there on the bottom, it says sponsored by the Cook Daniels Fund. Um, so it is um, designed to bring lectures about international art to the Denver area. And that is my talk about Florence Martin. So I just think she's a really fascinating character. And I wanna say thank you to you for watching this and thank you to Florence for all her contributions to Douglas County and the Denver metro area, and for having such an extraordinary life. Um, this shows some of my citations of where I got my information, as well as uh, ways to contact me if you want to know more. Here are some additional photos and videos from some of the things Sean mentioned during her presentation on Florence Martin. The first was, Sanctuary Golf Course, and some photos of Daniels Park, including a trailhead named after the very own Florence Martin. There is a shelter up the top, which has barbecue pits and a nice view. You can see some of the new fencing that's been built all around Daniels Park recently and a view of the backcountry of Highlands Ranch off to the west. Cherokee Ranch is not too far away to the south. There's the fence from the one of the original farms, and they're known for Santa Gratuitas cattle. Here's an aerial view of Cherokee Ranch set up on top of the bluff there. 
just to the south of Daniels Park. And here's a panorama taken from the tower at Cherokee Ranch facing to the west. We hope you've enjoyed this presentation. Come again when we can meet in person and we'll look forward to seeing you at Southridge in the future.